So let's talk about practice planning, right? So for me, there's three components. There's player development, which is the skills, skating, passing, receiving, shooting, one-timers, making plays off your backhand, protecting pucks, all of those things. There's team development, which is your game model, systems, breakouts, four checks, neutral zone play, whatever it may be. And then there's physiology, right, which is an important aspect of our game that I don't know there's a lot of talk going on about physiology, right? There's cardiovascular conditioning. There's neuromuscular conditioning, your brain's ability to send messages to your muscles quickly. There's also the role of the central nervous system and, and building those adaptations that are so important and, and that type of conditioning. So physiology is an important aspect of, of, of uh, practice planning. And that's something we, when we talk about, when we build our practices in Pittsburgh, one of the first things we try, to, we try to answer to ourselves, and we get our strength and conditioning guys involved, and as you guys can imagine, when you're playing an NHL schedule, we're playing three, three nights a week, sometimes four nights a week. And, and so we're trying to make sure that we manage workloads so our guys aren't exhausted, right? So we got to try to get better when we go on the ice, but we can't just we can't go on the ice and, and then just put the pedal to the metal every single time, right? So the, the first question we ask is, what kind of a practice are we having today? What's the workload? And, and then from there, then we start to drill down and, and, and then we build a practice. But the physiology is always, uh, is always one of our main objectives. So the skill development we talked about, right? And, and about the science of it. And, but there's also position specific stuff, right? Wings have wall play, taking rims around the wall or centers, or defensemen going back for pucks, puck retrievals on a breakout or a neutral zone counter, things like that. There's position-specific skills that, that we work on with our players, and I'll show you some examples. But once again, we're looking for alignment, right, where we're training these skills within the context of how the game's played. So ultimately, what we're looking for, our goal is execution under pressure, right? And that's the definition of skill that Damian Farrow had that I think is the most brilliant definition that I've heard. So the team, on the team development side, that's the tactics, right? There's offensive concepts, there's defensive concepts, there's transition concepts, right? When you think about invasive games, instinctive sports, there's four states of the game. There's offense, there's defense, and then there's two transition states. When you lose the puck and you've got to track to defense, or when you play in defense and you get the puck and you've got to try to take advantage of a window of opportunity and, and transition to offense. When you think about the amount of times the puck changes possession in a hockey game, there's probably a significant amount of the game played in the two transition states. Would you agree? So ask yourself the question as a coach, do you practice transition states? So if you're in a D-zone coverage drill, when the, when the defensive team clears the puck, do you blow the whistle down? Or do you allow them to transition out of the deep ice and try to get a scoring chance at the other end? Right? I'm not saying that the first way is wrong. It all depends on what your objective is. But what I, what I am trying to encourage you to do is think about those transition states. And once again, I'll go back to small games. For me, one of the greatest values is by confining space. And, and you play in those small game scenarios is your training a transition mindset because by nature of confining space the puck turns over more often so players get more and more opportunities to learn the intellectual skills the recognition the anticipation things like that right but also the physical skills to to take advantage of a transition state on both sides of the puck so and then there's the physiology right so we, we use, we utilize in Pittsburgh, and a lot of it is because of the nature of the NHL schedule, but we utilize this, uh, this type of training that's called undulation. And essentially what it is, is, is if you look at these two graphs, right, it's, there, there's, there's a line of, uh, with volume and intensity. We try, to, we try to practice at a similar intensity. If you look at the graph on the right, the green is the intensity. So if you just look at the green, 
The green stays fairly flat. The blue is the volume. That's the, that's the, the volume of workload. So that's time on ice. So these are actual days when, when, we, when we went back into the bubble in Toronto a year ago. And this, when we came back to, on the return to play, coming out, of the, uh, coming out of the stoppage and play with COVID, so we had this mini training camp, right, for X amount of days before we went to Toronto to go into the first bubble. These are the actual practices w from a workload standpoint that we built, right? So day one, our practice was an hour long. Day two, it was 45 minutes. Day three, it was an hour. Day four was a day off. Recover. After the day off, which will deem day four, it was an hour and 15 minutes. The next day was 45 minutes. The next day was an hour and 15 minutes. The next day was 45 minutes. So there's the undulation, right? Our intensity stayed the same. But by manipulating the volume, we were giving our guys the ability to recover. Sometimes it was just partial recovery. So you can still run purposeful practices, right? When you think about hockey, okay, and this is the whole idea of neuromuscular conditioning versus cardiovascular conditioning. It's essentially an anaerobic game. It's a 60-minute game. It takes about three hours to play in an NHL game. The best players play 18 to 20 minutes. Their work-to-rest ratio is about one to three. Most players, it's one to four, one to five. Our goal in Pittsburgh is we're trying to practice where we can sustain 90 to 95% intensity. So we can maintain a quality of execution and we can train speed. If we allow, if we let our drills or things run longer to the point where the quality of our execution diminishes, is compromised to a certain level, we start training different energy systems, and then we start training slowness, right? So we're trying to train speed. We're trying to train in an explosive, dynamic environment. There needs to be a rest component. There needs to be a rest component. And as coaches, depending on what your schedule looks like in a week, how many games you have, or in a month, things of that nature, you can control the workload, the physiology. And I think that's an important conversation that should be had. So things to consider, right? Work to rest ratios. Are we learning a skill or are we performing a skill? The higher the intensity of the workload, the more rest you need, right? It's pretty commonsensical. Ice utilization. I don't know how many of you guys, uh, coaches in here, squirts or peewees, sometimes they split the ice up, right? So can you, you run stations out of four corners? You got half ice, you got a full sheet. How many coaches you got on the ice? Those are, those are all considerations that you need to take into account when you're planning a practice. And once again, a lot of this is going to revolve around an age-appropriate approach. So I'm going to show you some things we do with the Pittsburgh Penguins. The first question you need to ask yourself is, where am I in this development process? What are my players' poten uh, potentialities and or limitations, and what makes sense, right? Because age an age-appropriate approach is a critical aspect of the development process.